down, right? All of you are done. Oh, yes, so just come in here maybe. Uh, okay, so I want you to help me to just remind what we talked about last time. Do you remember? So what we talked about in the exchange we talked about individual and variables, okay? So what was variable? That's correct. That's the type of variable, right? Mm -hmm. When I, yeah. The characteristic of the individual. Exactly. Characteristic of individual is variable. And then, as you mentioned, variables are two types, right? We have quantitative variables. We have qualitative variables. Alright, so now your question was about qualitative or categorical variable. So what is the qualitative or categorical variable? What is, oh, what it is? It's a, uh, it's like a, a, not numbers, but like quality, like group or category? Not numbers, groups or categories, correct? So categorical variable or qualitative variable uh, are the variables that are divided to groups or categories. They are not numbers. But quantitative variables are numbers, right? They are shown by numbers and we can measure those numbers, right? And we can apply, apply arithmetic operation on these variables. So what's a good example of quantitative variables? Quantitative variables to show quantitative variables. 
Okay, so today we are going to go through this visualization. So if you have, you can use this graph to show its value. So last time you stop at this point after this yes right and then today we begin with explanatory data analysis which we kind of went through last time I talked about that a little bit so what is explanatory data analysis means we go through the data set we examine the data set and go through each aspect of data set. Specifically, we start with variables. We interpret or analyze each variable separately. For example, if I, in a data set I have uh, a student, these are individual, then I have their GPA, their age, their height, their weight. I will go through age. Analyze this first. And then I will go through weight, for example. Analyze the weight of a student. And then what I use, first of all, I will use graph to visualize each of these variables separately, right? And then I can use some uh, measures, like we can calculate average. We can calculate a standard deviation. We will, we will go through all of this later. We'll go through all of these things for each single value. And then what we do now, we can compare these variables. So what's the relation between weight and height of a student? We go through comparing these two variables related to each, in relation to each other. And then we can use graph also to show these relations. What is the relation of height and weight to each other? So this is data uh, explanatory data analysis that we are going to go through this in chapter one and chapter two. So we are currently learning part of it, and then in within two lectures we are going to we are going to talk about measures, how to calculate some measures, and uh, yeah, we are going to go through all of this. Okay. Draw a graph. The first thing we should know is the distribution of a variable. Distribution. Remember this word. So the distribution of a variable tells us how often that variable were repeated. Or if you have categories for a variable, it will tell us how often a certain category was repeated. If I have a gender as a variable, I can say 20% of students are male, 80% of students are female. This 80%, 20% shows us the frequency of a student in each category. And together, this information, count or percentage, shows us the distribution of this variable. How the categories, for example, are uh, like fluctuating from one category to another category. And then we'll go through that for quantitative variables too. It tells us how many times a certain value repeated. And then we will learn about, uh, I mean, we talk about frequency a lot because what is the frequency? In meaning, it says, is the number of occurrence. Means how many times a certain group, for example, repeated. How many people are in a certain group, for example. So it means how many times this happened in a data set? How many times we saw female, 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 female? How many times we see male, 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 male? So this is the frequency, okay? Okay. So 
For example, how many uh, students have uh, a certain grade above a certain grade or below a certain grade? So these are all distribution and uh, we use distribution to draw a graph. display categorical variable or quantitative, you are going to use either bar graph or pie chart. We begin with pie chart. Again, we need distribution of the variable or frequency of uh, people or individuals in a certain group or category, right? So this is an example of a pie chart. As you see, it's a circle, like a pie, it has a slices, right? A slices in a pie chart represent a category. If I have two categories for gender, the pie chart will have just two slices, correct? And each slice will show the frequency of that certain group. If I have more female in a class than male, means the slice that represents female category uh, is bigger than the male category, right? So this is how we use a pie chart. We use each slice for a category. It depends on how many categories we have, we will have the number of slides. So there are some things actually about the pie chart you should know, understand. Okay, so look at this. It says we have different groups like rent, grocery, transport, planning, uh, school fee, saving, which probably represent the economic or how people spend their money in a household, right? So there are different groups of spending money. And it says expenses. So expenses is a categorical variable, right? Which has one, two, three, four, five, six categories, right? Right? Correct? So how do we get percentage? Percent means a portion over the total amount, right? And it's represented in, um, I mean, in a form of out of 100. So what out of 100 means? Means if we add all these percentage, we should come up with 100, right? 100% means overall. So one of the characteristics of uh, pie chart is that we must have the 100% of individuals presented in a data set to be able to draw a pie chart. If you are lacking one of these groups and the overall comes up to 80%, for example, we cannot draw a pie chart because imagine one slice will not be there. Correct? And it will not be a pie chart anymore. So this is the most important thing about pie chart. If we are drawing pie chart, we must make sure we have all the individuals presented to be able to add up all the percentage to almost 100%. And later I will tell you why I'm saying almost 100%. Okay, so. How do we get the percent for rent, for example? We add all these numbers, right? Get the overall, and then we say 7,000 divided by all the numbers, and then whatever we get, present the percentage. For example, it must become 47%, right? 7,000 divided by the overall number. Add up all of this, that would be the overall number. Okay. This is a 
another example of the pie chart. It shows one, two, three, four, five, six groups of ethnicity. Yes, race. Right? So race is a categorical variable. In this example, we have six groups for race, right? And based on some data they had, they know 45% of those people were Hispanic and the smallest group was 0.4%, um, which probably represent the American Indian, right? Because this, this is lighter, this is darker. So this is the white, Hispanic, Asian, all other, other because I don't see the uh, yellow. So yellow must be the smallest group. So this is the choice of graph. If you choose something like pie chart, for this example, you are going to miss some of the group and slices if they are too small, unless you label them. Unless, for example, here you say, this group, American, uh, African American, for example, this group, Hispanic, for example, on the on each side of the uh, slide. That you can do with computer, with applet, statistical applet, you can do that. Okay. The next graph that we are talking about is bar graph, which again represents the uh, categorical variable. The bar graph, as you see, an example is here. Bar graph has some bars. This bar represents categories. If I have five categories, I will have five bars in bar graph. Uh, if I have two categories, I will have just two bars in the bar graph. This example shows the heating, cooling, water, heat, heating, uh, appliances, lightning, and something else. I wish they could maximize this for me. I mean, I hope they fix the flickering uh, aspect of this and later I will ask them to maximize this in a, with a better resolution. It's not that obvious. Okay, so bar graph. Here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven groups, right? And then here, one, two, three, four, all the months of uh, a year. And this shows birthday of a student by month. So birthday of a student is a categorical variable. It has 12 categories. And then this one, probably uh, appliances at, in homes, energy consumption. Energy consumption will be the categorical variable. Okay, so the numbers you see in each of these shows the frequency, right? Frequency for each category. It can be shown by percentage, it can be shown with count. These are also uh, frequency. It says number of a student, a student. Okay, this is count, right? This is count. For example, this category, uh, January, February, March shows there are almost four students in this category, right? Four students have a birthday in March. Okay? Okay, so write this down. On the axis here on the y axis of this bar graph, we will show the frequency of each category. Pretty 
frequency of each category are shown on the y-axis, either by count or percentage, either using count or percentage. On the x-axis, you will see the category, name of this category. The difference between pie chart and uh, bar graph is that in pie chart, all the categories must add up to 100%. Otherwise, we cannot make a pie chart. But in bar graph, that doesn't matter because we can just choose two categories and show them on bar graph. So in bar graph, doesn't matter if the percentage don't add up to 100% because we can choose just two bar to compare two categories to each other. So this is the main difference between bar graph and pie chart. Okay, so now you should see the next one. Then you will understand we can rotate a bar graph and doesn't matter uh, if like which axis is frequency, which axis is uh, the name of category. Now here, on this axis we will have the name of category, on this axis we will have the frequency of count, right? As long as we have both of them. You must have frequency of each category. You must have the name of each category, right? In this way, you are showing the bar graph in horizontal way. In the previous example, all the bars were vertical, right? Okay. So you can rotate the bar graph to show it in different ways. Also, you can use like different variables in one bar graph as long as uh, they uh, have the kind of similar meaningful group. Later uh, I will bring some example like that to you so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, do you have any questions? Anyone else? No? Everything is fine so far? Sure? Everything fine? Mm -hmm. Oh, great. So what did you learn? We learned about two graphs so far that have been used to visualize um, qualitative variables, right? Qualitative variables are variables that are shown with different group or categories, different groups. So now more on pie chart and bar graph using example. Okay, so now this is more specific. We have an example. It says, what do the 1.5 million full-time first year students plan to study? Means what is their major, right? It says here are data on the percent of post-secondary first year students who plan to major in several, several discipline areas. And then, remember, field of study is a categorical value. Individuals here are the students, right? Then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten categories, right? The last category represents some other categories which were very, very a small percentage, right? They add them all together. And then total. Here we have the percentage. Each of these numbers shows the frequency of a student in each category, right? Add them all. We have 98.7%. Because we are showing pie chart, the percentage must add up to almost 100, as I mentioned once. Almost 100, and here is almost 100. So why do you think we have 98.7%? And it's not exactly 100. Why? What is that? Error. <laughs> yeah, 
error. I thought they were not in the same. <laughs> okay, yeah, you're right. So all the categories you see here, they have some percentage. It may be 15.59%, right? They round it. So rounding error. This may be 11.69. This may be 11.52. All the errors or rounding error that they didn't mention here would add up to another like one point something percent, right? And that's why this is almost 100 percent. Still, we can uh, draw a pie chart. But still, it's almost 100 percent. Okay. So, how to interpret that? We can say, okay, what is the smallest major on this graph shown? It seems the physical science has the smallest slice, right? And when you go to the table on the left side, you will see, yeah, physical science is 2.7% of overall, which is the smallest group, right? And then it seems like biological science or health science are the biggest group in this uh, pie chart. Um, so this is the way we can like compare. For example, okay, social science, there are more students who like to go to social science in compared to art and humanities, right? So these are the way you can use pie chart to have an idea how the categories are uh, like distributed and how students like uh, different majors, right? How many students, which is the most frequent category, most uh, uh, for favorite field among the students, or which is the least, right? So this is the way we interpret the part. And then, similar example, we are going to use a similar example to draw a bar graph. Uh, because still we are dealing with categorical variable, right? So here, the bars, each bar is showing a major, right? Okay, so this one is the smallest because the height of each bar shows the frequency, right? The height of each bar shows the frequency. There's one thing with the bar graph that you can easily do is that bring this one to this side, bring this bar to another one, to organize them, descending, ascending. So you can organize the bars the way it's much easier to understand and interpret the bar graph and compare the categories. And then another thing, as I mentioned, you can just pick two categories and compare them. Draw the two bars. So now next slide shows you a bar graph that was ordered from maximum frequency to the minimum frequency, highest to the lowest. And then here it says, what sources do Americans age? What sources do Americans age? 12 to 34 years used to keep up to keep uh, keep up to date and learn about news. So Pandora, Spotify, and the rest of news station. So we say brand of music station. Sorry, music station. Music station is the categorical variable, right? And Individuals are American age 12 to 34 years old. So I'm more specific here. Individuals are the American who are age 12 to 34 years old. Okay? Do you get this? And then brand of uh, music station will be there and category. And then each category is shown with percentage. These are the frequencies. Okay. We'll talk about it right now to clear all the confusion. 
These are the frequencies in each category. Of course, these are numbers. But these numbers don't make this variable a quantitative variable, right? Quantitative variable is totally different. There are all numbers all over the place. Next, uh, within next few slides, we'll, I will show you. These numbers you see belongs to each category and represent each category by frequency. So this doesn't make it, these values doesn't make this variable a quantitative variable. The nature of variable is it's still quantitative. Okay, so remember this in mind and then compare with next examples when we are talking about the quantitative variable. Okay? Okay, so now get together it's the symbol. Two two. Okay? Choose choose someone. Choose someone to sit beside each other and you can turn that side, you can go there, oh, okay, you can go that way. Or you can come here, <laughs> yeah. Fine. Okay, it says the body mass index was determined for 10 high school students and their weight and status was recorded as healthy weight, overweight, obese, in the table below. So each of these uh, represent a category, right? Sorry? Okay. Uh, and then it says display the distribution of these weights uh, in a well labeled graph. What graph you are going to use? I will give you a hint. Bar graph. Yeah, bar graph is the easiest, right? In this case. So, what you will do first, count each category. First, you should know how many categories you have. Then calculate frequency in each category. Help each other. Okay, you have five minutes. Yeah, if you have question, ask each other, help each other. these categories and write down frequency front of each category. Frequency means how many times one category was repeated, right? A count in each category will be the frequency. Okay. You don't have to do the percentage because count is easier in this case, right? Mm -hmm. Just find a count, count for each category and write it down, then we will start from there.
Okay, great. I think you all got it. Okay, so help me now here. How many people in this category? Five, five. Five. How many people in this category? Four. Four. How many? One. One. So this is frequency, and each frequency is in pounds, right? Pounds, pounds. Then I will have x, y axis. On x axis, I'm going to show the name of categories, right? Then I will choose location. Am I right? So let's say this one, HW. This one, OW. This one, OB. Right? And then Y axis must show, <coughs> show the frequency, which is in pounds. Right? So because I have five, maximum value is five here. I would like to say, okay, if this shows five, this shows, well, okay, 2.5. And in this way, I'm going to measure this axis, right? In, wh what, in whichever way it's more clear for you, you can measure this Y axis. Okay, HW, the height will go up to here. And you can fill this, right? And then you can actually, you have a label here. That's fine. You could put the label on top too, but you already have and this is very clear. OW4, let's say, oh, no. this is 4, and then I'm going to say, the height is 4, am I right? And then this is just 1, let's say the height here, represent 1. And if you had more bars, you could even write down 1, 4, 5, right? Okay, good. Do you have any questions so far? was easy, right? Great. Okay. So, again, qualitative variables can be represented using either bar graph or pie chart, right? Okay. Now, quantitative variables. So here, you will see a table. And in this table, we have three columns. On top of the table, it says percent of a state high school students graduating on time. The first question I will ask you, who are the individuals here? Just read properly and then catch that. Okay. Who? The states. Great, right? What do you think? Washington. Who are the individuals? The states, right? We are showing the percent of a state high school a student graduating. Percent of state. Do you get that? So we have the state name in the first column of each, right? And then in the next column, we have the percent of high school graduating, right? It's not graduating. These numbers are all in percentage. And then we have another column which shows region of that state that the state is located, right? So what type of variable this one has is 
Okay. Quantitative. What type of variable this one is? Qualitative. Right? And this was the individual. Correct? Okay. So, if I wanted to draw a bar graph or pie chart, I would use the region because region is quanti qualitative variable. And I would count uh, frequency of each region. I would see how many of these states are debited. I have one, two, three, four. I would count all of W and I will say the frequency of region W is blah blah. The frequency of region S is blah blah. Region N is blah blah. Right? And then you would draw a bar graph or using computer sheet, draw a pie chart. Okay? Now we want to talk about this one, which is a quantitative variable. For each individual, we have a value. You're not counting to separate these frequencies for each category, right? So this is a huge difference. The values are exactly in front of you. For this state, percent is this one. Percent is this one. Okay? And it's measured by percentage. So our quantitative vari uh, variable is here. Now, look at this. I will explain this in more detail ne in next slide. But I wanted to have this here. Just you can compare. So what happens, it says class. Class from 55 to 60, one time. Class from 60 to 65, two times. And then it says from this one to this one, and if the, this side doesn't have equality, means 55 is included in this class. 60 is included in this class, right? 60 is not included in this class because there's no equal sign, right? Okay, we have some class. What are these class? This says 55% to 60%. It says 65% to 65%, 65 to 70. You see, they are all continuous connected to each other, right? If 60 is not included here, it is included in the second class, right? Now, the percent of high school graduation, which are from 55 to 60. Okay, I will go through these numbers, and I will find whichever number that is between 55 to 60 percent. Where is that from? In here? In all the way down here. District of Columbia, right? This is the only state that falls in this class. I'm calling this class, class in general. Then, 60 to 65. I will go through all of these. Um, New Mexico here, right? One state. Two states, right? Two states fall in this second class interval, right? Then 65 to 70, you will definitely find three states that fall in this class interval, and so on. So those number on the right side are the states that fall in those class intervals. And the left side are the class intervals. These are not categories. I know for a second you may get confused, but no, these are not categories. These are all the numbers that are connected to each other. 
These are not like uh, white, black, brown, another color, right? These are continuous numbers. Oh, histogram. We are talking about histogram here because we are talking about quantitative variable. And histogram is one of the graph that can be used to visualize quantitative variables like the percent of high school graduating in a state, right? The first thing in histogram you must um, to draw his histogram, you must know is the range of values. You must know what percent of high school graduating is the lowest, what percent is the highest in the data set. If you have the highest and the lowest, the range of value will be the highest minus the lowest. Then you will use this highest value and the lowest value or the range we will use the range to decide on how many class interval you want. Because that's your choice. As a person who is analyzing, if you want to draw a histogram, that will be your choice. Or maybe the question is asking you. In here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven class intervals. The minimum value was 59, the maximum was 88. 88 minus 59, we have almost 30 value as a range, right? And then we will say, okay, if each class interval is can contain like distance of five value we can have seven almost only seven class interval and if you look the last number is a little bit higher than the maximum number, because maximum number was 88, right? But the maximum boundary for the class interval is taken 90. Choose a 90. Doesn't matter. As long as we can include 88 in the last class interval, right? As long as all the class intervals have the same width, they all are five values apart, right? You could choose just four class intervals as long as you could um, fit all the values in those class intervals and as long as the width for each class interval were exact similar, right? So it depends on you how many class intervals you are choosing how you want to show this histogram. You will find the range. You will divide this range to different class intervals of the same width, right? They have the same exact distance. And you have to organize it in this way. If 60 doesn't include here, 60 must include in the next one. 60 cannot include in both class intervals because if one state is 60%, which one does a state belong to, right? Which class interval? So you have to be more specific. The, uh, if a, a state is 60%, it definitely goes here. It doesn't go in both. 
Okay. Is that clear so far? Do you get that? Everything fine? Okay. Here is the histogram that we created using the percent of high school graduation in the state, right? And then class interval. There were seven, right? Actually, I showed it here again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They are continued numbers. That's why they are all close to each other. They are, there's no space between them, right? Look at this, there were space between them because they were not continuous values. They were just separate categories. But here, no, they are continuous values. That's why there is no space. So this is the biggest difference between histogram and bar graph. Bar graph, you will see gaps between the categories because they are categories separated from each other. But in histogram, you don't see any gap because all the values are connected to each other. The class intervals are connected. Okay, so what do we have here? Now at the height of each class interval is the number of states that falls in each of these class intervals. Here we have just one state, District of Columbia, fell in this class interval. That's why the height is small. This one, New Mexico, Nevada, right? And so on. And this is the highest. Um, number of a state contains the highest number of the state, right? So, remember, on the x-axis of histogram, you will have the continuous numbers. The numbers are the values of that variable, the percent of high school graduates, right? From the minimum to the maximum, which is the range, right? On the y-axis, you will see the frequency of the states that fall in each class interval. So on the y-axis, you will see the frequency of the states that fall in each class interval. They are in count number of the states. Do you have any questions? Just clear. Okay. okay. What else about histogram? Well, there is a lot about histogram, but this is one of the most kind of famous or commonly, commonly used graph for quantitative variable. And um, for example, if later you want to go through this, you will find some tools that help you to find the proper number of class intervals for the histogram based on the data set, based on the number of observations you have. Again, when I say number of observations, is the number of individuals you have in the data set. And in that example, last, last example, number of states, like 52, right? Am I right? So will be the number of observations or number of individuals. And then he here says, as a rule of thumb, the number of class intervals k Let's say you have like k class interval, one, two, three, whatever number. Uh, it can be chosen to equal the smallest whole number that makes two k in two multiply k greater than the total number of observations. Means, let me write it down here to see if the example that we had here followed the rule. So, well, I believe we have 52 observations. Let me 
One observation means n is fifty one. And then how many class intervals they have? Seven? Yeah. Why? Why? Well, doesn't represent the data set very well because we have 51 observation and two multiply whatever class interval must be greater than 51, right? So using the rule, you would choose maybe more than seven class interval, right? Rule of thumb. Um, right? A 26 interval. Yeah. So, well, I'm pretty sure uh, when I read this, it was to take greater than the total number of observations. Uh, but yeah, if to take greater than 51, means seven doesn't represent this data set very well. Right? It must be like 26 class interval to represent this very well. Okay. Or maybe where I got the rule of thumb from was not right about the size between 2K and 6. But for this one, this is most accurate. I use that a lot. So it's one plus log of n base two, which is the number of class interval. N is the number of observations. It means one plus log of 51 base two. You will find log of 51 base two and add one to that, and that will give you the number of class. So this is what I used before. Okay, yeah, so there are some tools. If you are interested, if you are doing a project, you want to draw a histogram, you want to know how many class intervals exactly to use or how how many class intervals represent a gas better, you can use different rules. You can do your research also to know more about that. Okay. So far, we learned about histograms. It's the graph that is being used uh, to visualize the. My voice is more clear. Oh, sorry, maybe it's loud. To visualize quantitative variables, the variables that are dealing with values. Okay, so now you tell me. Question. So I talked about this, but just think about that. What is the main, main, main difference between histogram and bar graph? Well, yeah, that is true, correct? But before, before even that, if you want to think about bar graph, what is bar graph for? What is histogram for? Bar graph is for qualitative and Yes. So that's the main, main, main difference between these two. As soon as someone tells me, what's the difference between bar graph and histogram? You can say, oh, histogram is used for quantitative variables like age, like weight, like height, like your score on an exam. But bar graph is being used for qualitative variables, like variables that have categories, like hair color, like eye color, like race, right? So this is the main and the first difference between these two. 
And the second, yeah, there are gaps between bars because these bars represent categories and categories are separated from each other. But in histogram, on x-axis, we have vanity. They are continuous. They are connected to each other. That's why we don't have any gap between the class interval. Right? Okay. So, and I want to say, oh, on a horizontal axis, you will see values on the horizontal axis of bar graph, you will see categories names. I want to say that, but all of a sudden there are some graphs that are rotated, or you know, so I cannot specifically say, yeah, on x axis, you will definitely see that. But keep in mind that for both graphs, we have frequency, but the nature of these frequencies are totally different. And the other uh, part of graph, if you are dealing with bar graph, you will see categories name. If you are dealing with the histogram, you will see values, which are the connected uh, and continuous values, right? Okay, anything else? The values that have unit of measurement. Yeah, I forgot about that. The person of high school graduation had a unit of measurement. If we are dealing with height of pupils, for example, uh, on the x-axis of histogram, let's say our histogram will be like that. And this is the height. Height is in, let's say, feet, right? You will see all the numbers here, feet, in feet, right? Okay. So, yeah, there is a difference between bar graph and history. Okay. Anything confusing? Sure. Everything is clear. No question. I will go through some basic as much as we have time, and then later uh, we'll have more kind of we'll dig into it to see what's going on. Okay, so to interpret a histogram, so I'm talking about histogram, you're dealing with quantitative variables, right? To interpret the histogram, you have to look at the overall pattern of the histogram. And you will find some important things, like what is the shape of this overall pattern? What is the center of the histogram? What is the variability or spread of this histogram? Some histograms have one peak. You know what a peak? That uh, top part that has the highest frequency because the height shows the frequency, right? Some histogram has two peaks. So these are the things that we will go through the histogram. And then there are some observations that we call them outlier. And those are the observations that are different from other observations. They fall outside of the overall pattern of histogram. So these are some things uh, that are important when we are talking about the histogram. And uh, we will go through almost all of them in the first and second chapter. Uh, in first chapter, we will talk about the shape of the histogram. Now we will go through that. And then we will see the outlier. And then in next chapter, we talk about center variability, this kind of things that can be even measured. We will have some measure. We can calculate them. Oh, let's look at this. When I said peak, this one. What this means, means there are more individuals that fall in this class interval, right? The highest frequency means the 
highest class interval is the peak. And this is the gap for this one. And we are going to just talk about the histogram that has uh, just only one. Okay, so we're going to talk about the shape of histogram. Look at this. So these are the histogram with class intervals, right? And there are all these class intervals that you saw in previous histogram. If you connect the midpoint of each class interval to each other, you will have some line like this. Some line like this. And then later in higher math, you may learn you may learn about integral and how to find the area under this line. Because imagine if there are some corners like this outside of the line, if you cut them, you can fit them all inside these empty spaces. And that means if you find the area under this, you will have the area of all these class intervals. Because all those uh, small corners that are outside, they can fit inside where you have empty spaces like this one, like this empty spaces, this empty spaces. So finding area under that line is by finding the integral and gives you the uh, area of all those class intervals. Okay, later we will learn about density here, but I wanted you to just assume that if you see something like this, this is a density curve, this is a line that's covering all the class intervals, and we use this line to show the shape of histogram. So this histogram is shown by its density curve, by that line that was covering all the class intervals. So just imagine there are lots of lots of, lots of class intervals there, right? This shape is the symmetric shape because if you draw a line on the peak, to the x-axis, the right side of the line and the left side of the line are the mirror image of each other. So that will be the symmetric shape. And in nature, in reality, it's very rare. It's very rare that you have a height of people in a population, in a, in a world, whatever data set, which is symmetric symmetric. Means all the people are like frequency about the middle. It's so rare. So it's not ever perfectly symmetric, but it's almost standard. So remember, I will talk about this right now. Just remember on the x-axis, you always have the values of, for example, height, weight, percent of high school graduation, right? What else? Other measure, for example, that can be measured because we are dealing with quantitative. So on axis, on the right side, we have the higher value because imagine that uh, plane uh, of x axis and y axis. On the x axis, if you go to the right side, you will have higher value. If you go to the left side, you will have lower value. The corner, for example, is U, right? So just imagine that this. Go to the right side, higher. Go to the left side, lower. Then we have a right skewed shape, which says there are more frequencies on the left side where the lower values are located, right? If, for example, weight of people or height of people was like this, I would say, oh, there are high people, there are more people, sorry. There are more people that are uh, shorter, for example, right? Because on the x-axis, we are short, tall. There are more students, for example, get lower grade, for example, right? 
your knees and then get higher. So right and skewed knees, the skewness is to the right side. The skewness is to the right side. The gap is extended to the right side. And then left and skewed means the skewness is on the left side. The gap is extended to the left side. If this is about height of pupils, we have more pupils who are taller, right? Because the height shows frequency. There are less pupils that are shorter. Okay? Oh. We will stop here. And we talk about the histogram, interpreting histogram, and then we will have a stem and lip plot. We will talk about that a stem and lip plot. Uh, and a stem And we go through the shape of histogram more next lecture, okay? And then um, you can, again, you can start on your homework as soon as right now. There are questions that you can answer with the knowledge you have so far. Okay? Do you have any questions? And then next time on the forum, you may have two questions. Just to refresh your memory from the next lecture and from this lecture. Okay? Any questions? Nothing? Okay. So we'll see you on uh, Thursday. Okay.